I, I'm very particular in thought as far as my audience. I really, it, Christians, I mean, Christians, yeah, sure, Christians should read my book because it's all Christian based. But my real audience that I want to reach are people people who are not necessarily Christian or not necessarily believers or might be on the fence. And they might get an idea that, hey, this is a different approach for me to understand Jesus. This is a different approach for me to understand how everyday people have challenges and then have challenges with their relationship of belief. So. You know, even I think I told you yesterday, even one of my editors questioned, you know, a, 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 a particular sentence that I had written in, in one of my books that maybe it was a little bit, you know, too much. And I thought to myself, I'm not writing for a Christian. I, I'm writing for somebody who who understands that kind of thought process. Um, I did tone it down. Um, but I think that I think that in order to relate to people, you've got to be honest and you've, you've got to be a part of their lives as much as they want to be a part of your characters. Hey, David, I just want to thank you so much for having me on your show. I really appreciate it. And um, it's wonderful to have people like you who support uh, writers that aren't necessarily super duper popular. Anyway, thank you so much. And I wish you the best in the next year or this coming year, I should say. Thank you. Bye. Welcome everyone to living the next chapter. I have my guest joining me today from the RV, which is great. I've got my fire on here in my basement and it's great <laughs> to be able to connect with great authors and talk about the writing journey and everything. Welcome, Sarah, to the podcast. How are you? I'm excellent, David, and thank you so much for the invite. I, I truly appreciate it, and I think this is going to be super fun and informative, not only for your listeners, but for me as well. Yeah, and we had a little talk yesterday. We I always love to do a pre-interview and get to meet my authors ahead of time. And just talking to you, I just came away from that thinking, wow, what a great person to talk to. I'm really excited to have this conversation today. So welcome back. It's great to have you back. Hey, okay. All right. So let's start in at the beginning. At what point did you wake up one morning and say, you know what? I'm going to be an author. Like, take us back to the time when you hadn't really released a book yet, but you were thinking about becoming an author. Take us back there and and help us catch up to today where you are now. Sure. Um, I was out walking one of my dogs and I was thinking about Jesus and I was thinking about little kids and not so much little kids but younger people and thinking about how I could let them know about who Jesus is because I know growing up and even though I grew up as a Catholic um, and I had a good feel for the triune God um, Jesus was always kind of I don't know, an enigma to me. So I thought, you know, this would be something to put together a story that maybe younger people can relate to and and um, want to explore a little bit more in their churches or with their parents or what have you. So um, the Lord laid on my heart to do a actually a tween book um, called A Christmas Dinosaur. And it was about a young man who was homeless with his mother and his father. And he was biracial, so he had a lot of challenges in his life. And um, he started out in Florida and ended up in New Hampshire and had never seen snow before. And this was a Christmas that he was worried that that Santa wouldn't come. And um, Christmas Eve, a little shepherd boy shows up in his bedroom while he's shivering and wondering if Santa's really going to make it. And so this young boy, this young shepherd boy, then proceeds to tell him about the first Christmas and about Jesus' birth, about the shepherds and about the angels. And as the story progresses and the little, the little shepherd boy disappears, the next morning, the, the young boy, Josh, has a wonderful Christmas, but then he ends up in a not a very good situation outside in a blizzard. Hmm. So it, it brings to the forefront how young people can, mm -hmm. can depend upon the Lord, can pray to the Lord, and how the Lord can bring things together to make things work for them. And so that was my first book. Nice. 
And so the second book was, was, was a sequel, sort of a sequel, although it's a standalone, um, about Josh being a little bit older. And sure enough, the little shepherd boy comes back again as a young teenager and then tells him the story about how what happened after the birth of Jesus and how Herod had threatened. Well, he threatened. He actually did kill all the children two years and under that were in the Bethlehem area and how Jesus, Mary and Joseph had to take off to Egypt. And so. Um, Joe, uh, so Josh listened to the story about how that all progressed and it was, uh, an adventure for all of them. And so then after that book, I went on to a young adult, and I'm sorry, with an adult book and the Lord really laid on my heart to start focusing on adults. Mm -hmm. That's a big switch then from writing for a, like a children's age audience to an adult audience. Um, was it hard to make that switch in your writing style? Well, not really, because I think that I was so excited about the content, okay. and it was called Blink, and it's about end times, and it's about prophecy, and it was very, very, um, so much laid on my heart that this was time for, for me to get out there and talk to the people about what we've got to pay attention to in terms of end times. And so what I did was, as I, as I pulled together four parallel stories, one was a, a family, one was the United States government, the third one was the European Union, and the fourth one was Israel, and how they all went in parallel once the rapture happened, and once the tribulation kicked in, and how each one of these prophecies in tribulation affected them who were essentially left behind. Wow. Okay. So where is, where are you pulling your research from? What, what is inspiring these books? Because the well, topics are pretty, I, I, pretty intense and pretty direct. Well, I'll tell you, I, I really, number one, lean on scripture that that's first and foremost, when it came to the two younger books, um, there's a dusting of scripture and a dusting of theology, but it's more of a story adventure to bring kids in to pique their interest, so to speak. Mm -hmm. With Blink, that was a lot more serious. And so I obviously uh, depended upon the book of Revelation, but because the book of Revelation is a little bit complex, I also brought in um, Dr. David Jeremiah's book on um, understanding prophecy and also a gentleman named his last name is greg and he has four parallel views of um the rapture and of the tribulation so i kind of combined some outside theological research with the actual um book of revelation because we needed that depth and then from that book i went on to a friends and followers and that's a story of a of a young woman and her friends who follow Jesus through their through his first his last two years of ministry. And they're trying to decide, uh, do I believe in the Lord? Is this guy? I mean, I shouldn't say, is yeah. this guy really the Lord? Is he really the Messiah? Some people believed some people didn't. And of course, there was um, adventure involved in it, but also persecution. And it followed along with with the book of Mark. So it, it kept up the pace of the book of Mark. Mark is kind of a, a, a fast paced book yeah. in terms of um, following Jesus ministry. So I, I, I followed that. I followed the book of Mark along with my story. And then, of course, the last book, which is um, Solomon's Concubine that I just recently released in 2022. Amazing. OK, so what's the what's the, the, the span of time from book one to book five now how long have you been writing for um i think it was like around i think i started around 2012 i think okay. yeah and um so yeah from about 2012 i believe nice and but my bigger last you know maybe three or four years is when i was really concentrating on the adult stuff okay what have you learned about yourself at becoming an author well, first of all, you got to have confidence. Um, I think as anybody who is in maybe the arts and they're projecting ideas to the public 
sometimes you're not sure, you know, am I good enough? Am I making sense? You know, whether it be, I guess, music, whether it be podcasts, Mm -hmm. whether it be um, books, whether it be art, there's a a sense of maybe a little bit of insecurity. So I always thought, you know, am I, am I, am I doing an okay job? And, and the Lord said, Hey, wait a minute. I'm the one that's helping you. You're not doing it on your own. I, yeah. Are you really questioning me? Hmm. He said, you know, essentially chill out and 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 understand that I am with you in this journey. And there are some people who are going to like it. And there's some people who are not. And then there are some people who might actually learn something from it and maybe even think about me. So I, I got over that, that feeling of, you know, not being up to snuff, so to speak. And that, hey, if you like the books, you'll like them. If you don't, you don't. And so my my job really is to listen to the Lord and be obedient to him and, and follow his footsteps because I don't create outlines for any of this. Yeah. Okay. Do you have somebody in mind as far as an audience when you're writing or are you writing from your knowledge and you're hoping that your audience will find you? Like, how, do, how are you approaching that? Well... I, I'm very particular in thought as far as my audience. I really, it, Christians, I mean, Christians, yeah, sure. Christians should read my book because it's all Christian based. But my real audience that I want to reach are people people who are not necessarily Christian or not necessarily believers or might be on the fence. And they might get an idea that, hey, this is a different approach for me to understand Jesus. This is a different approach for me to understand how everyday people have challenges and then have challenges with their relationship of belief. So, you know, even I think I told you yesterday, even one of my editors questioned, you know, a a, a particular sentence that I had written in one of my books that maybe it was a little bit, you know, too much. And I thought to myself, I'm not writing for a Christian. I'm writing for somebody who who understands that kind of thought process. Um, I did tone it down, um, but I think that I think that in order to relate to people, you've got to be honest, mm-hmm. and you've you've got to be a part of their lives as much as they want to be a part of your characters. So when you're writing, you're 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 working on this by yourself. You're crafting the story you're building the world around the book your book goes out into the world and then you wait yeah tell me about when you hear back from somebody that's read your book and some of the feedback that you've had that come back to you that kind of maybe shocked you or supported you or encouraged you what have you heard back from your readers well of course there's been some people who are you know who are very enthusiastic about it. And there are some people who are very good critics and I, and I appreciate their observations for sure. And then there's been a few people that, you know, just it wasn't their type of book to read, <laughs> but I think the most important response I got was from a person that um, was a friend of mine, but was always kind of sarcastic when it came to God, you know, was not a, a big God person at all. And they read, blank and they read Solomon's concubine and they were really very much enthralled with the whole story and blink has a lot more scripture in it because it is following the book of revelation Solomon's concubine while it is based on um first and second Corinthians and first Kings um it's more of a, hey, this could happen. This is plausible in this particular time. So there were two, two kinds of um, approaches to bringing God into the stories. And, and, and he, he bought into it. And I felt real good about it. Mm. But don't forget, there are people who, who don't. So, you know, yeah. you can't please everybody, that's for sure. Yeah, that's the one thing that I find even in podcasting and music and everything. You you create something for an audience and some people are going to love it. Some people, it's just not going to fit for them. And you quickly have to identify, you can't write for everybody. There's no way you can write for everyone, include everyone. So you have to identify who 
your audience is and who your audience isn't. And that's a hard thing to do because you don't want to you don't want to leave anybody out. You want to include everyone. But sometimes just what you're writing about or what you're performing as a musician doesn't sit with everyone. And you just have to understand that and adapt and focus on your audience and make sure you serve them well. So I, I always find that interesting from an author's perspective as well. Well, I, I think that what you're saying is absolutely true, David. I mean, really and truly what you're saying. Um, it's it's good to probably have a niche. Um, like, for example, romance novels, uh, mystery novels, um, adventure novel novels, that sort of thing. Um, and then there are, of course, the Christian novels or the religious novels. I guess my thought process was I wanted to combine all of it together which you know might or might not work. But I think that it gives everybody a little piece of, of, of um, movement, of interest and of drawing people in. Um, and so when I was thinking about my niche, I knew definitely my niche, I didn't want it to be focused strictly on Christians. I really, really didn't. I, I wanted to bring other people in because that's the whole point of the Great Commission, right? Yeah. And um, you don't have to preach to the choir. Yeah. Yeah. Or do you? Well, sometimes you do. Sometimes the choir needs it too, I think. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, tell me a little bit about maybe some of the hurdles that you had to climb over as an author. Did you get to a point when you were writing maybe your earlier books where you kind of hit a wall or you found it difficult and kind of how did you write through that stage? Well, I've always depended upon the Lord to, to get me through because I, I don't I don't use an outline and I just sit down and then the pictures come into my head and the dialogue comes into my head and I kind of move forward. But there has been times when I've come across, hmm, now what? You know, to make it interesting for somebody, to make it plausible, to make the story flow. And so I, you know, do a little bit of praying and I say, hey, Lord, can you help me out with this? Because I'm just not sure about the direction to go into. And, and as it turns out, um, he's always he's always shown up. He's always helped me, and he's always moved me forward. And and so I can honestly say, without sounding, I don't know, melodramatic, I can honestly say that in all my writing, whenever I come across a problem or a concern or a, a roadblock or a wall, I have to ask the Lord to help me, and I have to overlook the fact that hey, this isn't about me. This is about God. And we're trying to move this thing forward to get it out to a big group of people. And so he's helped me, bottom line. Nice. Nice. So tell me about, so you get your book done. You're on your fifth one. Now you've finished that. How, tell me about the, the promotion side of, of writing. Because I find a lot of authors that I talk to, their publishers are great to get them to the point of the book is produced. And then what? Now you have to get out Bingo. there and sort of talk about all these things, right? So. Bingo. You Tell me a little bit head. about that. What, what What is that like for you? Wow. You know, you're really, 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 really spot on. In the beginning, I would guess I was a little bit of a novice and I was a little bit not very well versed in, although my background is marketing, believe it or not. Okay. Um, I, I wasn't really versed in, in marketing of books because that's a whole different kind of situation. And so I kind of depended upon my publisher, thinking my publisher was, you know, doing a lot of the marketing and the publicity and stuff. Great in distribution, mm -hmm. great in distribution. But as far as actual marketing and public and, and um, publicity, and I say this to all authors out there, people who are you're writing your own books, and I mean, you're you're um, you, you might have found an author. I mean, uh, you might have found a publisher, or you might be self-published. Um, please bear in mind, it took me a long time to figure this out and to get to it, is that you've got to do so much yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so, so David, to your question, it's really important for the author to get out there and, and hit social media, reach out to people who do podcasts, reach out to anybody who can help publicize your book. Um, because if you're going to depend on your publisher, it's not going to happen unless you're a, you know, a, a bestseller, but if you're just a regular writer mm -hmm. where you're not really earning a living from your writing, you've got to understand that you've got to do so much of it on your own. Yeah. That's the one thing I hear so often from the authors that come on 
and it's just not knowing where to start, I guess. Has there been anything that's been successful for you for promotion, promoting your books that you would suggest to people? Well, you know, I'll tell you what, I, um, I think LinkedIn okay. is very good hmm. because you're getting a group of people who, um, um, for the most part, they're working and um, they probably may be a, um, you know, a demographic that are active in terms of media. And so I found that I get a lot of action, a lot of views, okay, out of LinkedIn. And the second thing I've done is I've gone to Instagram. Now, I was never an Instagram person. I've gone to Instagram and I've posted regularly. I did the research of what the best times to post. And I also came across a couple of promoters on Instagram that really bumped up my views. Now, we all know views don't don't equate to sales. Mm -hmm. They don't equate to sales, but it gives you visibility. Facebook, I don't know. I mean... I don't know about Facebook and I guess you could join the different groups on Facebook because there are a number of uh, book club groups yeah. and some of them allow you to publish, uh, to post your stuff and other others just want you to discuss other people's books. Um, I don't know. I, I really don't know. I, I, I am not a bestseller. Obviously I, I think I do have a pretty good um, following of people who are interested Um I'll be honest with you guys out there. I don't earn a living from my books, but my goal isn't to make money anyway. My goal really is to get the Lord out there. Mm. I mean, that's really my goal is to get that visibility. So even if on Instagram, they see my covers, they know that there's something up. They know that there's something worth thinking about. So if anybody who's out there, just go up to S.A. Jewel and then scroll through all of the, the, the covers that I've designed and you'll see that there is a, um, um, a flow and that I'm getting kind of a message out. Mm. And it, it might be different for other people who don't have that kind of focus in terms of, of, of getting the word of the Lord out. But I think that even if I get a visible reaction from somebody it's worth it excellent and what about we talked about reviews earlier but when you get reviews online and somebody buys your book what does that mean for you as an author well it's important to me but i have to be perfectly honest with you on this mm -hmm. is that i don't read the reviews now okay. believe me i i look at the stars but the but when I started to read reviews and I got a couple of bad ones, it really bummed me out. And mm. I thought, oh, you know, yeah. it really did. And then and then I questioned, you know, my 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 work. And then I realized, wait a second, there are always going to be people who don't like your work. There'll be people who do, but there'll be people who won't. So don't get hung up on the reviews now. On the other hand, the reviews probably will give you insight on things you can improve on. Yeah. But I, I try to stay away from reading reviews, but I, I will say that I wanted to check out my stars. Yeah. So if I see more stars, I know that I'm okay. I'm going down the right way. Because <laughs> I say the same thing happens in podcasting. We get reviews as well. And sometimes people just don't connect with the, with the, the topic or the podcast or the host or the guest. And there's a simple answer to that. If you don't connect with what the content, you're just not the audience that we're looking to serve. And that's okay. If we don't, if this, if this message, podcast, whatever, this book doesn't connect with you, that's 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 great. That just means that you're not my audience, and I'm okay with that. And I'm going to focus in on the people that that, that the podcast serves. I'm going to focus in on the audience that my book serves, and go deep there, and not worry about maybe the people that don't connect, because again, that's just not my audience. And I think it's just another way of looking at it. Oh, David, I think you're perfect. I think you're absolutely right. And, and what you've just said for your listeners, for what you've just said is incredibly important. So for the listeners out there who think they might want to do a podcast or they might want to write, or maybe they're even an artist, you've got to understand that just exactly what David said, 
There are going to be people who are not your audience and that's okay. And we've got to understand as, as artists, so to speak, yeah. that we've got to be accepting of that and, and really focus on the people that we know we can reach. Because my fear, Sarah, is there's going to be authors out there who want to write, but they're crippled by the fear of being seen as an imposter. You know, that who am I to write this book when there's so many other great authors in the world? Who's going to listen to me? Right. But the one thing, and I see it in podcasting, and it goes back and forth, is there's only one you, there's only one me. You see the world through your eyes through the things that you've lived through in your life, the knowledge you have and your your curiosity for life, you're going to write from a place that no one else can write from and reach an audience that no one else could ever reach because you're you. There's no other you. No one else can duplicate what you can do. So if you're afraid of starting because you're fearful of somebody might give me a bad review, somebody might not like what I write about, so I'm just not going to write. Think of all the people that you've helped that wouldn't have been helped had you not sat down and wrote that first book. So don't be afraid of all the people that might say no to you. Focus on the people that will say yes and be there for them. I think that's that's the key for everything right there. I think I think that's just a beautiful way of putting it. I, I, I really do. Because not only what you just said just covers it all. But suppose one line impacts somebody, yeah. just one line. Yeah. You've already accomplished what you set out to accomplish. And I love so the fact I, that you're not motivated by the money as well, which is, there's so many authors I talk to that are so focused on the money and that success equates to money and dollars in the bank. That's how I know I'm successful. You're looking at it at a different point of view. And I like that because- that's going to come through in your writing as well. You're not here to sell books for the financial side of it. Yes, it's important, of course, obviously, but your motivation comes from a different place. That's got to be acknowledged and, and uh, rewarded as well. I think that's a great thing. And there are people who, who, who hit it big first yeah. time out. I yeah. mean, it does happen. But, but for the majority of people, it doesn't. And if you, if you think that you're really going to do, you know, you're going to actually earn a living from writing, I mean, you might, yeah. chances are you might not, especially when, when, when they break down what the percentages are from, you know, distributors yeah. and publishers yeah. and all that jazz. But um, yeah, it, I, I have to be realistic about, about my work and, and in the fact that I was motivated anyway by God telling me, hey, I want you to do this. And just do it, you know. So that's where I come from. Okay, so somebody's on on the website. They're looking to purchase your book, one of your five books so far, and they're ready to hit buy. They're not really sure if they should buy any one of your books. They now get to hear you, right now, and you get to address them and say, "This is why I wrote the book. This is why I write for you. You should buy my books because." And then you can fill in the blank. But they're sitting there contemplating purchasing one of your books. What would you like to say to somebody right now before they hit buy? Well, I'll tell you, I, um, I, I would like to just tell you about my, my most recent book, because I think that mm -hmm. people, can, people will kind of connect to that. And that's Solomon's Concubine. And, and I wrote it because I was telling David earlier I was aggravated with King Solomon. You know, everybody makes a big deal about him, about his wisdom and his money and his wealth and his power and all that stuff. But, you know, he had a thousand women. <laughs> and to me, that always irked me. And I thought, doesn't anybody question his business of a thousand women? I mean, you don't see a whole lot of it discussed in the Bible, that's for sure, other than he had a thousand women. Oh, oh, and that he did, they did lead them astray um, because a lot of them were pagan women. That there is a, there is a chunk of of that in the, in scripture. But um, what I would like you to see is that it, it's not all a great 
story of these 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 um, biblical people. They've had a lot of baggage, a lot of baggage. King Solomon being one. And so, how would it feel for a concubine, a, a young woman, who gets inducted into Solomon's harem and doesn't want to be there? Yeah. But she has no choice. So I guess what I'm saying to to any of your listeners is that my books are pretty different. Solomon's Concubine is it's not really it's kind of like a me too kind of a thing. I know my publisher didn't want to go down that road, but it's but it's but it it does show mm-hmm. you the 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 aspect of being a concubine to King Solomon. Um and then the other book of of friends and followers is okay, you've heard about Jesus and you're hearing Jesus is doing all these great things, but who really is he? And so you've got some friends who believe and some friends who don't. So you can go down that path and read that book and see how things play out. And then my personal favorite is is Blink, which talks about end times. And I think that's really contemporary because all you have to do is look around what's going, what's, yeah. what's going on right now. And it's pretty darn scary. So for anybody who's listening and is interested in any of my books, um, particularly the adult books, I would just suggest what you think is interesting to you at the moment. Yeah. And you can, you can get my books on um, Amazon.com for sure. And, and you can get them in the ebook, and you can, which are very inexpensive, by the way. Mm. And you can get um, the paperback. Some of them have some of them are in audio as well. But um, I would suggest I would suggest really and truly to go to Amazon because you get them quickly and you can get the ebook. Awesome. And we'll put links to all that. What about how people connect with you? You said Instagram. Is that the best place for people to connect with you? Well, actually, I have a, um, a ministry and it's called Team of God. Okay. And what I do is um, I, I work with um, a ministry group uh, in Uganda, and we also work with a group of people that are um, local. And so email is great. Um, and, and my email is teamofgod at earthlink.net. Email okay. me. Awesome. We'll put that in the show notes as well for everybody. Oh, um, yeah. And, and my website, too. Yeah. We'll for, for, the, for the For the ministry. Okay, we'll put that in there as well. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for making time for me today. Um, like I said, we met, we talked yesterday. I walked away with, from that conversation happy and excited to come back and talk today. Uh, I'm, I'm so impressed with what you've been doing. I encourage you to keep moving forward, keep writing, keep doing what you're doing. And I would love to stay in touch if that's okay. Oh, absolutely, David. And I've got to say something to you. Hmm. You have been a real joy. And and what I love about what how you've conducted this this interview, so to speak, is that you you made it really real, and you also offered in your perspective of certain things because you've done an awful lot, and you're doing an awful lot, and you're impacting an awful lot of people, and a lot of people would love to do the type of thing that you're doing. So I think the connection between you and I and your listeners. We're all in this together and we want to encourage, I want to encourage you. You want to encourage me and we both want to encourage the listeners. It's a perfect matchup, right? It's perfect. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And I love your heart. I love love how everything you're doing. Please keep going. Please don't stop. And um, again, let's stay in touch. Okay. You bet. And thank you so much. And listeners, uh, happy new year. There you go, everyone. Right from the RV. You know, this is awesome. Yeah, from the RV. <laughs> <laughs> so great. Thank you so much for being part of this. You bet, David. Take care. All right. Cheers. Thank you so much for being here with us today again. Thank you for subscribing and following. And you're listening this far in the podcast, so you are my best friend. I'm sorry, but you are now my best friend. So welcome. Nice to meet you. Thank you for being here. Uh, LivingTheNextChapter.com has a link on the website to our Facebook group. Are you on Facebook? Probably. Uh, You can go there and you can actually interact with our guests. You can talk to them. You can see more about their journey, about their books. You can speak to them directly. You don't need me. You can come right to LivingTheNextChapter.com 
click on our Facebook link to our community. You can talk to other listeners of the podcast from around the world who are on Facebook. And, again, speak with our guests. Don't you want to speak to the guests you just heard from? Yeah, you can do that on Living the Next Chapter. Go over there. There's links to our Facebook group. And you're welcome to join. Thanks for listening. MindShift Power Podcast, the podcast for teenagers and those who work with them. There's a huge problem in America today. There's a very large disconnect between teenagers and the adults who work with them. I'm looking to bridge that gap with real, raw, honest conversation, not held back by the chains of political correctness. You cannot solve a problem you do not understand. Want to understand teenagers today? Listen to this podcast. This podcast is for teens in the U.S. and Canada. To learn more, go to FatimaBay.com slash podcast, or just look for MindShift Power Podcast on any listening platform. I look forward to you being a faithful listener.